Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to the 571st episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. Stay tuned for the most amazing deal on bulk seeds and seed saving education you have ever seen. Normally around this time of year, our team puts on an event called the Great American Seed Up, where we pack hundreds of people into a room over a few days to scoop amazing open pollinated and heirloom seeds for their gardens. We came up with the scoop your own model because the majority of the cost of seeds is actually in the packaging and distribution. So by eliminating these costs, people can buy the seeds in bulk at bulk prices. Well, as you can imagine, packing hundreds of people in a room is not feasible these days. So we had to get creative and we came up with seed up in a box. And what's amazing about it is that now you can get these bulk seeds wherever you are in the world. We've chosen seeds that are popular, non-GMO, open pollinated, and easy to grow. They're bundled 10 jumbo packs per variety so that you can share them with your community, family, church, or school. Your job is to split them into individual packages. Our job is to make them as inexpensive as possible. And right now they're averaging about 60 cents per individual jumbo portion. With all the uncertainty in the world, a lot of people are thinking about how we can make our future more food secure. Seed Up in a Box is a great way to do this because each bundle has enough seeds and education so that you may never have to purchase seeds again. This is an amazing deal and I'm so excited for the opportunity to take the great American Seed Up all around the world via our Seed Up in a Box. Learn more about Seed Up in a Box and get your own bundle by going to greatamericanseedup.org. That's greatamericanseedup.org. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Greg Peterson coming to you from a chilly urban farm in the heart of Phoenix, Arizona. I am here tonight with Bill McDormand. Welcome, Bill. Hello, Greg. Good to be here. Always great to chat with you on these uh, monthly seed chats. Thank you so much. Tonight... Yeah. We are going to be talking about a bunch of things, but where we're going to start with is seed health and your health. How does saving seeds create a healthy community? And I know Bill's got some stories about that. So how about if we just jump in? You know, the idea for talking about this just came from the fact that we've just gone through a pretty divisive political time in our country. And there's all yeah. sorts of calls for us to come back together and uh, rebuild some semblance of a community. Yeah. You know, and do and do that with people that, you know, a lot of people were angry at, actually, mm -hmm. and a lot of misunderstandings. And, you know, the why and how that all got so extreme is probably the topic for another kind of podcast. But, yeah, you know, for us, we're you know, I was thinking we're so lucky because we have, you know, one of the most powerful things at our disposal to help, in fact, rebuild that community. And that yeah. and I've always believed that was seed. So. You know, and I'm sure we all have stories about people that normally wouldn't hang out together, maybe would go out of their way never to hang out with each other, mm -hmm. to find themselves, you know, exchanging seeds or ooing and aahing over the same tomato or, you know, countless other stories. And so I just yeah. thought I'd, you know, go through some of mine. Greg, I know you've got some. And for the listeners, if you've got a particularly poignant one, yeah, too. You can do that and, you know, post a comment for us as well as a question because uh, yeah. it is a time to to share, I think, now. And uh, I think that sharing can bring us back together. Yeah. Well, and you know, especially, uh, well, actually, let me go a little direction, a different direction with this. When we have a party, where do people normally end up at? A party? In, in, at a party, people end up in the kitchen, around the food. You know, oh, we, come yeah. together, no. we come together around food. And you've said it many times, Bill, that you know, without local seed, we can't have local food. And everybody needs to eat, whether you're, a, you know, no matter what, what part of the political spectrum you're on, we have to all eat. And I know that the, you know, the people that are a little bit more right winging, they call them preppers. And the people that are a little bit left leaning, maybe are called hippies, but we're all out for the same thing. Yeah. And I had this realization and this is as political as I'm going to get, 
And I had this realization <laughs> this week that if we're going to get past this and move on and move forward positively, we have to let go of what's happened and jump in and act as if everything's fine. And that, I think, I think you're right. What you said earlier, I think the best place, one of the good places, I don't know about the best place, but one of the good places that that can happen is around gardening and around seed saving. So, yay. Yeah, I remember we were in Hotchkiss, Colorado for a seed school in a day one time. And it was sometime after lunch and, and um, we were, people were still kind of coming together. And, and I looked over and what I would call one of the most, you use the term prepper type people that have come to our seed schools and they're, mm-hmm. everybody's welcome. You know, everybody. Yeah, kind of absolutely. Going, welcome in my boat. And he was a, a good seed saver, and, but he was sitting right next to this young man who had, you know, tattoos all over, had his gauges in, you know, his ears and, you know, looked pretty out there for unsure for this guy, but they were sitting next to each other talking about beans and mm. they were both so excited. Yeah. And I looked over at that and I thought, wow, if that can happen, anything can happen. You yeah. know, this we really yeah. are. That was just a great example of people coming together around something they really love and we're passionate about that we can all share. Yeah. That was great. So seed health and your health. How does saving seeds create a healthy community? Well, my wife suggested telling a story. One, maybe one of the more amazing things that I've heard around building community around seeds is a story that Rowan White told me about her community. She started a seed company called Sierra Seed Co-op. And actually, she didn't start it, but I, she was one of the initiators. And there were lots of people involved. And so we were talking about how that got going. Because starting your own small seed company is quite a chore. Oh, yeah. I went through that. I went through it that a couple of times and promised myself I'd never do it again. You know, it's just right. so hard in the beginning. But so, you know, Rowan's story was different, though. She actually had monthly potluck dinners for almost two years, I think she said, with her neighbors and people around that were interested in gardening and maybe getting into growing seed. And so the whole idea was to build a community and learn a lot about each other and learn how to communicate with each other and become really good friends as well as neighbors. And once they had that base, then and only then did they start talking about growing seeds together and starting a seed Mm co-op, which blossomed into this wonderful and beautiful company. And so, you know, I like that idea that how everybody in your neighborhood could come together and do that sort of thing around seeds, that they were interested enough in doing it. And it provided them some some financial means for everybody. So that was good. Yeah. So what does her co-op look like? that was uh, created around food? Well, it was to grow and sell seeds that were adapted to the Central Valley, you know, to Central California. I think she was near Nevada City. And I was a little bit surprised the other day. I was online. Maybe somebody out there listening can give me an update. But when I looked the other day, I no longer saw the seed selling part. And so I think they've evolved even further in what they're doing now. I know Rowan is teaching seed saving and is involved in uh, Indigenous Seed Keepers Network. Uh huh. But the co-op itself was just set up. So uh, I think at one point they had 13 different families or uh, small operations growing seeds, and then they would market and sell them. They would package them and sell them on the Internet under one business name, Sierra Seed Co-op. And they had some tremendously wonderful varieties that were that they found that were, you know, endemic, I'll mm-hmm. call it, although that's a different kind of word to that area, and, and really – you know, furthered this idea that I've always been so fascinated with of each region producing its own seeds. And that was the way that she figured out how to do it. Nice. And what if you guys, uh, uh, so we're going to talk about, uh, a lot of you have signed up for our Global Seed Summit, which is happening next week. And so we're going to talk about that in a little while. Uh, But how did Rocky Mountain Seed get started and why? Rocky Mountain Seed is a seed organization that you were instrumental in help starting. Yeah, I, you know, it just seemed to be the natural outgrowth of things I've been doing my whole life. I had a small seed company in the mountains of Idaho, uh, High Altitude Gardens, and later called Seeds Trust High Altitude Gardens, and I ran that for 28 years. And through that, I got to know a lot of gardeners and growers and seed buyers in the Rocky Mountain West. Mm-hmm. And so when the time, uh, a time came when I was asked, if I wanted to uh, help start a seed conservation organization, a nonprofit 
that would further, you know, the idea that seeds would be produced in every community for those communities and really build resilience, as you said earlier, you know, local food with local seeds. You know, it just seemed like a natural outgrowth to all the things I'd been doing before. I'd been the director of a seed conservation organization in Tucson, Native Seed Search, and I had knew everybody in the Rocky Mountain West. I had, I think, like 24,000 people on my mailing list by the time I sold High Altitude Gardens. And so, you know, I put both those things together, and within a few years, we were up and running. We got some generous funding from an, a wonderful, unknown, anonymous donor, and uh, we were off and running. And now, surprise, yeah, we're over six years old, which is really, really kind of a shock. And we've got, I don't know, five or 6,000 people in our email universe. We've got 105 teacher seed teachers signed up, many of whom have gone through our seed teacher training program. We've got over 300 seed stewards that have all pledged to grow and save and share the seeds to at least one variety. I was just looking, there's 82 seed libraries have signed up, which is really gratifying. And so that's another way to build community around seeds. And so, mm-hmm. you know, and you can find all of that on our website if anybody's interested at Rocky Mountain Seeds. Dot org, And you can pull up directories and click on the people I've just been talking about, wherever they are. And they're all over North America, surprisingly enough. You know, we started this to focus on our region, but, you know, there are seeds and there are seed people all over and everyone wants to learn. And so we never limit anybody who wants to help us. When you have some really cool programs, you know that you have your grain trials, because here, let's face it, if we just grew the vegetables that we generally know how to grow, that's what, what, like only 10% of our diet or something like that? Oh, it could be a little bit more than that. Yeah, they say 70 to 80% of all our food comes from plants, you know, grains, actually. <laughs> right, that's, what, that's where I was going. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. if we're growing 10 or 15 or 20% of our vegetables, you know, with squash and watermelon and that kind of stuff, it's still only you know, a small fraction of what we eat. So you guys, you guys jumped in and did grain trials. And I I actually want to prompt you to talk about Sonoran white wheat and how, how you were able, you and a crew of people were able to resurrect that over the course of about what, five or six years? Well, we, we helped with that. You know, the, there are a lot of people involved all over the United States, actually, you know, to give credit to everybody. Um, mm-hmm. Lynn Roberts and Anton Mills played a role in that. Ellie Ragosa and her Heritage Grain Conservancy, you know, there's a lot of people that played a role. But when I was at the director at Native Seed Search, we, along with, I think, four, five, six other either uh, institutions, businesses, or individuals got a SARE grant to start growing it on a larger scale. And so the story at Native Seeds was that, you know, only a few handfuls of the seeds were to be found at one point. There just weren't that many around, especially the variety, the white Sonoran wheat that had been grown and saved for 400 years in the Southwest. Mm-hmm. And that's what we were really interested in, is bringing that back in the Southwest. And so so we started this program. And uh, by the time I left as director, I was told there were 1,100 acres of it growing, you know. And so I'm, and I, there's not that, I don't know of that many acres personally, but there are a lot of acres being grown by several growers in the Southwest. And now it's a staple for several bakeries and mills and breweries even. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a great story of how we can, you know, sit back through the past and take advantage of all the gifts that we've been given. You know, this week goes all the way back to the Fertile Crescent. You know, and it was so good. It was brought with the Moors into southern Spain where it was used. And then when uh, Spain, you know, conquered the New World and they sent their missionaries then up from Mexico into the southwest, that's what they brought. It was the wafer wheat or the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. That's what they, you know, so they could have their ceremonies. And so they took it everywhere they went. And then it got into the hands of the indigenous peoples in the southwest. And they're the ones that really adapted it, you know, over hundreds of years and really built an elegant and productive agriculture based on it. It's deep rooted. It's incredibly drought tolerant. In some areas, it grows on monsoon rains. You know, we used to grow it through the winter. I mean, it's just really a resilient and wonderful weed. It's not, it doesn't have a lot of gluten or the kinds that you need to make really fluffy bread. Uh So it's used more, you know, in baking it as a pastry flour. 
but it has unsurpassed flavor, and I think that's why people really like it. So yeah, well, and the, 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 so the reason I brought this uh, this particular thing up was we're talking about seed health and your health, and right. I want you know the this particular bread is lower in the kind of gluten that makes us ill. So that's one of the that's one of the big magical yeah. things about this particular wheat. Can you talk about that? And then I want to I don't want to skip over how it happened. So go ahead. Yeah. Well, you know, so the smoking gun is still missing from all the gut problems people are having. You know, generally they're associated with gluten. And you know, you can see the, how big the gluten aisle is in your local grocery store now. You know, there are a lot of people with a lot of gut problems, and we didn't have those. Even, you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So something's changing and something's happening. And one of the, the great suspects is the kind of gluten that we find in modern wheat, the hard bread wheat that we grow for white flour. And that's over 90% of the wheat, or it's more than that, I've, I've been told, of all the wheat grown in the United States. It's almost all the same variety. I mean, genetically, it's all really, really similar. And so, and we did that, you know, for yield and to, fuel this huge industrial system and the bigger you make it and the more industrial, the more profit for the people that own it. And so that's, you know, where that's all gone. And so a lot of us have figured out that if you go back into the older varieties of wheat and grains, you actually have fewer of those problems. And I'm talking generally here, but this has been borne out by scientists. There's more and more papers coming. You know, I'm not talking about people that have, you know, a genetic problem with gluten. And I'm talking about people that are generally just have irritated guts yeah. around this sort of thing that are told to stop eating gluten and they'll feel better. And they do in large part. But now we're seeing a number of those people be able to come back and actually eat some wheat, especially if it's the older varieties. Going way back to the oldest variety, einkorn especially. Mm -hmm. And if it is prepared differently, if it's allowed to ferment for 24 or 48 hours in the old sourdough bread bread making methods. And it seems like both of those processes make it more edible, we'll call it. And that's certainly been the case in my family and the people that I know around me. I haven't had those kinds of gut problems, so I'm one yeah. of the lucky ones. But I sure love the flavor and the nutrition. You know, einkorn has 40% more protein than regular oh wheat. Gosh. Wow. You know, so, so you're getting more food. And, you know, the argument always comes up that, oh, wow, well, you know, we need the yield. If we've got hungry people. We're going to have to have industrial agriculture and we need these varieties to produce the yield, but as Steve Jones points out at the bread lab, the first thing they do with modern wheat on its way to be made into white flour is get rid of half of it. They strip yeah. off the outside and the germ. It's gone. It's almost half the weight. So if you want to increase yield 100%, <laughs> you know, of your, of your ancient and heritage grace, just grind and eat all of it, <laughs> which is what I do, which is better for you. So, you know, it's really great. Yeah. And you're right. Well, this is what we need to do to feed ourselves you know yeah. find the grains that were adapted to each of our regions that are deep rooted that mine more minerals that have more protein that we eat more of you know grind them fresh and eat them and then i think we've got a chance yeah and it's possible to grow enough grain to feed your family for a year is it not on a small plot of land you know i don't it, it's pro it is more difficult than you think probably and here's where some of the difficulty comes in for me and i'm starting to hit that now is um, to do it consistently on a small piece of land because mm -hmm. of rotation you probably need more land than you think you know and you should let it lay fallow a year maybe get you know i'm looking at chickens or some other kinds of animals you know it's the same old problem how do you rest it and get fertility back in it before you grow something that takes nutrition out of your soil but you know dr ralph bush at the air force academy who taught at one of our grain schools says that you know he measured pretty carefully he gets about seven loaves of bread a year out of a hundred square foot bed you know a John Jevons type yeah. type bed. So that's pretty good. I mean, how many loaves of bread do you eat? And how many square feet would you need to do that? I mean, I think that's where most of us are starting. And when you're at that scale, it's not hard to thresh it and to winnow it in front of a fan, you know, and clean it up. I've got a little desktop uh, grain grinder, a mock mill 200. So I'm always fresh grind my grains because a lot of the nutrition and flavor in a grain is in the volatile oil. Right. So as soon as you break that outside shell, you're from that moment on, 
on, it's volatizing and you're losing the best part of it, some people would argue. And so I feel like I'm part of that fresh flower movement now and I'm learning to grow more of my own stuff. Oats are pretty easy. I'll probably get to the point where next year I can grow enough oats for my oatmeal yeah. for the year. It's not for a big family, it's just for me, but I feel I'm pretty proud of it. And my God, the colors and the sizes and the oh, yeah. shapes and the beauty of these grains will take you away. I mean, it's just like, uh, unlike anything I've ever been around, it's my favorite kind of gardening now. So that's what really awaits you if you want to get into this. And they're easy to save the seeds from. They're almost all self-pollinating, which means you don't have to worry about them crossing. You just save the seeds plant them again. Well, how cool is that? You know, for rye and barley and wheat. Oh, man, that's it. And, you know, this is incredible. And rice. We're starting to play with upland rice varieties that grow just oh, yeah. like regular garden varieties. And that may be where the most food is grown for the easiest amount of input. So we're really excited about that. And I just want to end by saying something I did. I taught a class of 10 young people that were in college. They're kind of on a gap year program. And what I finally said at the end of it was, I said, if you want to be really cool in your community, talk about being building community. If you want to be really cool, go to a potluck dinner, go to a, a, a local community gathering and take a loaf of your own bread that you grew the wheat, uh-huh. you fresh ground, you 24, 48 hour per minute, you know, with just flour, salt and water and baked and it's still warm and fresh and take it in to that potluck dinner or, or grind and then roll your own fresh pasta. I've been doing that lately and take that to a potluck. I mean, this is what we're talking about. This is, you know, I think we're reevaluating who we are as people in our communities and who we want to be around and who we want to learn from. And boy, if you want to be part of that whole scene, I'll tell you, it works. <laughs> it's better than taking fresh tomatoes. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. So real quickly, I also want to touch in on how you went from a couple of pounds of, and I know it wasn't you, it was a whole community of people, went from a few pounds of Sonoran white wheat. First of all, where did you find it? And <laughs> you know, to several thousand acres. Because it's yeah. it's a story of exponential growth that we all can do. Yeah. You know, in our Heritage tri- uh, Grain Trials program, and we have over 100 people in that program now that are helping us. If you sign up, we'll send you seeds to the grains that we think will work where you are or ones that you want. And there are things like Tibetan purple barley or Harani durum wheat. And Harani was grown by Nebuchadnezzar in the Bible. I mean, we've got Queen Ashiba barley too, you know, things like like that wow. they say was you know named after i mean it's that old but it was so good it's just been around all those times and so when we send you seeds we'll only send you a few i mean we just have a few of some of these still we're still finding them we're trying to bring this whole thing back but you know if you only planted one of those in a pot say you live in a dorm room like the students i had a couple of weeks ago grow one einkorn black and tan, naked einkorn, grow one plant. I'll give you one seed, grow one plant. You'll end up with several hundred seeds from that first year. Uh And then take those and grow them out, and you could have easily two to three pounds the next year. Take that, and you can have 100 pounds the next year or more. And from there, it's thousands. And so that's how quickly in two to three, four years, you can gear up to feed almost any community. And that's just phenomenal. What else can you hold in your hand that could do that? It's just this incredible gift we've been given through all the work and all the seed saving for so many centuries and generations that, that allows us to do that. So so I was, you know, just to answer your question, at Native Seed Search, we were actually gifted a thousand pounds of Sonoran White by uh, Glenn Roberts. He had started Anson Mills and he was contracting, had just started contracting some farmers to grow ancient and heritage grains for him for his his mill anson mills you can find their stuff in almost every uh, high-end grocery store around the united states now and so i had quite a bit of seed for the first time we were growing and and expanding our own but i had some seed and some folks from uh, in southern arizona came to me and asked if they could buy 400 pounds of it they wanted to go big they had a 20-acre plot. We we're getting into grades, and they wanted to, they wanted to go big. Mm-hmm. And I and I said I thought about it for a minute, and then I said, No, I'm not going to do it. And they looked so disappointed. <laughs> it was like you know, <laughs> well, there is no other place to get this, you know. And and so I looked at them and I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give it to you. You can have it, 400 pounds, but. I want you to do something that Vanda Nashiva was talking about, something that's been going on in India for we don't know how long. Right. And that is um, every farmer that wants seeds and needs them should get them. So I'm going to give you your 400 pounds. 
If and when you can, however, you need to return twice as much back to me. And they looked at each other and, you know, there were some calculations going on or in their heads or whatever. And they said, fine, we can do that. And what that ended up being was like one twenty fifth of their crop they had to return by the time they were done. They went big with it. And so I actually, to be honest, forgot about it. And it was almost two years later. And I'm, I think I was getting ready to lead Native Seed Search. I don't remember all the circumstances, but I got a phone call from Jeff Zimmerman at Hayden Mills. And he goes, Bill, I got 5,000 pounds. Oh. Uh, Snort and white wheat. Where do you want me to put it? And I go, excuse me? <laughs> where did that come from? And he said, well, you know that original 400 pounds? Well, they passed on 800 pounds to somebody else, and they grew it out, and then they passed on their share to somebody else, and now we got 5,000 pounds, and we don't know what to do with it. Oh, <laughs> so, wow. What did you tell them? It, well, I, we, we took it. I, you know, I don't remember all exactly what happened, but, um, and some of it went to other people. I mean, that's how you build community. Yeah. And what I learned in that, Greg, was really uh, amazing that, you know, I think we shortcut ourselves sometimes when we buy and sell things. If I had sold that 400 pounds and they had paid us for it, uh-huh. uh, transaction done. Yeah. Right? They go on their way. I go on my way. But if you give it to them and they have this responsibility to pay you back, then I was worried about them. And I kept in touch. And they felt this huge sense of obligation to be able to perform so they could pay it off. Yeah. And I think through those that we developed a deeper relationship. I know we did. It was just great. And I think we should do that more and more with seeds whenever we can. Oh, big time. So uh, just as an aside real quick, if you're on a live event tonight and you want to sh- shoot us questions, throw them in the Q&A section, please. About, I'm going to say about eight years ago, I bought a packet, one packet, with probably 10 or 15 or 20 seeds, of Rio Red cow peas from Native Seed Search. Yeah. And those have now become a, the centerpiece, one of the centerpiece seeds in my fruit tree education program here in Phoenix. And oh first of all, I planted the packet, and the next year I had, I don't know, probably five pounds out of you know one packet of seeds. They're that prolific. And the really cool thing about Rio red cow peas or cow peas in general is they're drought tolerant. They love the desert. They grow prolifically. One seed could easily make you a thousand seeds the next year. And the, they're nitrogen fixers. So they're pulling nitrogen out of the air and out of the soil so that at the end of the season, like right about now, November ish, when they start dying back, I just, they're my mulch for the winter. But what makes them the centerpiece for my fruit tree program is it's very important here in the low desert to shade your ground, especially around where you're planting trees. So what I do, I have a, I have a uh, tube of them right here. This is a, uh, I've just picked it up off of the ground. This is a container that is uh, easily 18 inches tall and it's, uh, it's a plastic jar and it's, uh, four or five inches in diameter, and it's full. And these are seeds that I've been harvesting over the past few weeks. And what I'll do with them now is I have a Great American Seed Up card, seed card made for them. And I will, while I'm watching TV at night with my sweetie Heidi, I package these. And I'll put eight or ten seeds in a packet. And when people come and pick up their their fruit trees for my fruit tree pr- program in January... I give them a packet of seeds and say, plant your tree and put two of these under each tree. And oh then what gosh. that does is they sprout by, you know, June or so, and they shade the soil, making it that much easier to grow here in the low desert. Wow. Yeah. So, and, and oh, and what happened this year is I actually had one of my clients, they brought me a bag of them. So mixed in with this container on my desk is a small bag that somebody else grew and brought back to me. So, wow. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Well, just imagine being in a community where everybody did that. They all right. had their one thing. Yeah. You don't have to grow all your own seed and save your own seed. All you have to do is one thing like that. And if everybody did one thing, we'd all have enough. That's how the communities in Siberia were when I was there back in the day. They were right. all taking care of each other. It was just so wonderful. And I think that's the, you know, it doesn't matter your politics or your, you know, 
what you want. Let's just do that and all come together. And then we can probably have better conversations on all levels. I, re- I really believe that. Yeah. Not only does the gardening ground you out, you know, we know now that just putting your hands in the soil, like Michael Abelman taught us, oh, you yeah. know, <laughs> it changes your hormones. So we're yep. grounding people out and then we're getting them used to the idea of abundance. So it's not a zero sum game or scarcity. So you got to get your guns and protect what you have anymore. It's because there's so much of everything around you that everybody's sharing anyway, you know. I mean, there's lots of value in this. I've never been around anything that could, could change things on more levels than, than doing this. Yeah, exactly. Uh, somebody asked in the, uh, in the Q&A about Great American Seed Up Seeds. They are still available. Let's talk about that real quickly. I just posted in the chat the link for the Great American Seed Up. This is an, this is an interesting story of, of abundance about oh well it was it was June of 2011 Bill and I came yeah. to seed school in Tucson and you and I had a conversation about what it would take to make a seed bank in Phoenix and where we decided to go with it then was buying a freezer so I actually went out and bought a 25 cubic foot freezer and we placed an order for I don't know, a thousand pounds, fifteen hundred pounds of seeds that got delivered to my house, and all of a sudden we had a seed bank in Phoenix. The problem with that was, is it was a private seed bank in my in my office, is where I kept it at the time, and the the problem with that became it didn't solve the problem. You know, it didn't yeah. solve the problem of what happens. How do we get everybody with seeds here? So then after well, that, and they, go ahead. And they get old and die. <laughs> Who does? Well, the seeds, I mean, eventually, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's a big responsibility to try to take care of all of that by yourself. Right. So you and I talked about having regional seed banks and yada, yada. And what we came up with, I'm thinking this is back in 2000 and the fall of 2013. You and me and Bell were having a conversation. And what we created was what if there were 10,000 seed banks in people's homes and people's freezers in Phoenix? What would it take to get that done? And in about a 10-minute conversation, you and me and Bell came up with our event called the Great American Seed Up. And the, the Great American Seed Up, and when you come to the summit next week, we're going to have a video, show a couple of videos showing the, you know, how the seed up has progressed and what it is. But imagine a room, 10,000 square foot room that has over a hundred varieties of seeds in it that people could come and scoop up for a fraction of a cost of a packet of seeds. So what that did is that motivated people to, to stock up, but not to stock up to hoard them, but to stock up to learn how to grow their own seeds and save their own seeds. And so in 2000, and I think we started doing them in 2014, and we did a Great American Seed Up until 2019. And um, we'll tell you here in a minute about what happened in 2020, but give me your take on the Great American Seed Up, Bill. Part of the idea um, I learned from a woman in Idaho, this woman wanted to buy survival seeds and at the end of the conversation i said well you know that's not going to work <laughs> she, she goes what do you mean the seeds won't work and i said oh no the seeds will work you know i knew the seeds were good i said that it's just highly unlikely you're going to grow 36 different varieties of things you know and get them all to grow so that you could survive in case you you know the grid went down or whatever reason you have and i said and furthermore you know how long is that going to last if you're the only person growing food in an ocean of hungry people you know and in idaho i think at the time there are 2.2 guns per person so just think about that i'm going to grow my own food and survive you know Uh it's like that doesn't work and so she said so what would work and that was the question i said well the only thing that really, I would, you know, who knows if anything will work, but the only thing I would think that would work is if the whole community had seeds and yeah. could grow their own gardens. And she goes, I'll call you back. And she hung <laughs> up. And, about, and I thought that was the end of it. And about three weeks later, she called back, and she had organized what she called the Idaho Stake, which was a centralized body for all the Mormon churches in yep. the whole region of Idaho. 
And that's what they did. They got big bowls. They could, you know, we went, we tried to get them enough packeted seeds. And it turns out 90% of the cost of a packet of seeds, if you buy it, is in the packaging and the distribution to get it to where you want it. And so let's just dispense with all that. Let's yeah. just get you seeds. And so they could afford them. And so they just got out big bowls. And on church, after church one Sunday, had everybody in the Idaho stake go down a line and with little packets sitting in front of the bowls, package their own. Everybody wrote down their instructions and took home what they needed for seeds. And it was really a, an efficient and easy and beautiful way to distribute, you know, seeds to a lot of people. And so that's basically what we're doing with the Great American Seed Up. We're getting them almost farm direct, you know. Farmers don't sell their own seeds. But they, they're usually contracted with several, you know, growers. And there are a few of those that do open pollinated, you know, seeds, land races that are left from before the industrial storm, as I called it, and the whole hybridization thing happened. And so, and I just had learned who those people were over the years. And so we got in touch with them and we bring the seeds right in from them. They're the ones that clean them and bag them. And uh, we bring them into the seed up and we put them in buckets with, you know, popcorn buckets. We don't have fancy bowls. And people just scoop up what they need and put it in a packet. We've got little cards with the instructions on them and they take them home. And then all day long, we just teach people how to save them. We run workshops and how to start them, save them, and store them. And so, you know, how many thousands of people do you think now are doing that <laughs> in Phoenix because we've been doing this now? Right. Well, and that's what, and uh, in 2019, I think we had almost 900 people that scooped seed <laughs> in, in a two-day period. So COVID happened, and, you know, we couldn't put 900 people in a room scooping seeds, by the way, having – you know, and that wasn't all at once, but having three or 400 people in a room in a 10,000 square foot room scooping seeds is epic. It is amazingly mind blowingly epic. The energy in the room, it's like <laughs> Christmas times 10, right? And yeah. so again, once again, Bill, and well, I think it was Bill and Val that were having a conversation back in March. And uh, when we had our monthly Great American Seed Up meeting in March, Bell said, well, what if we put together packets for people to be able to do their own seed ups? So that's what we've done. And so we put together packets. And when you buy a seed up bundle for yourself and you can do them for you can you know give them as holiday gifts, you can we had one lady put on next door, you know, that community site next door. She said, I want oh, yeah, she found nine other people. Because what we do is instead of individual packaging, what we do is we put, the, put them together in 10 packs. So you can get a 10 pack of cucumbers, a 10 pack of wheat, a 10 pack of, and along with that comes the plastic bags to put them in and the business card that tells you all about that different variety. So if, if you go, to, and the link is in the chat box, but if you go to greatamericanseedup.org, you can find out all about how to do your own seed, uh, basically great American seed up on your own. And the really cool thing is, is that the amount of seeds that you get is, is three to 10 times what you get in a normal packet of seeds. Right. And we designed it that way so that we could super energize the local seed economy. Well, we just, and we're taking advantage of the fact that we don't have to package them. Right. I mean, we so we we are doing packaging now, but we're doing bulk packaging for you. Right. You're, you know, everyone's got to be the ones that breaks them down into individual sizes. And again, that's where all the expense is. So if you have a party and can do that, you can save tremendously on it. And yeah. again, it just gets more great seeds into more people's hands. And then what we do is uh, it comes with education. So at the summit next week, uh, Bill is on uh, Friday. And he's talking about seed saving. Uh, Bell's talking about seed saving. Bill is talking about how to store seeds. I know that uh, Kari is talking about how to, how to start seeds. Really, the, the keystone of everything that we do here at the Urban Farm and with seeds and with Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance and, and Kari's uh, microfarm project is education. We really want to teach you how to do your own seed saving, plant your own seeds and have you be successful doing it so that we can grow this whole thing exponentially. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. 
Yeah, we're not trying to build an empire here. <laughs> what we're trying to do is maybe just make it as <laughs> a human community, you know. And it's not even new what we're trying to do. We're trying to get back to what we had two generations ago. Right. You know, where every family, everybody that grew something saved seeds. And every, you know, valley and area was pretty much self-reliant in its yeah. own seed production. And that's just the most beautiful thing because every seed then is starting to adapt itself to where it is. And we get to help choose, you yeah. know, what we're going to have. So, yeah, it's really a beautiful, beautiful Total thing. And, you know, so, you know, modern language, it's like a big Costco or a pop-up, you know, event for seeds. And now you can do one and you can use it in your nonprofit or your garden club or, you know, another way to bring people together and build community where you are. And you can do it in small amounts. That's why we did 10 packs. I mean, if we do this long enough, we might do thousand packs. I don't know, you know, if people right. want them. But we did them small because that's CDC guidelines now, you know. Let's get together in small groups and do these sorts of things. Still take advantage of being around, you know, some people, but let's not be dangerous yet. The things are still, still, we still have to watch each other. So, you know, but it's, it's, uh, it's hopeful. I think that's the word, you know, that comes out all of this for me and these we head into the dark days of winter it's just so hopeful yeah yeah exactly i do have a couple of questions here tammy said mm -hmm. seed's still available at the great american seed up virtual event it is and i posted that link in the chat box christian says we can't all sustenance farm we've progressed that point past that point uh christian i actually think we can and I'll say more about that in a minute. And some of us need to stay specialized. That is true. But our commercial mass-produced system is harsh on the environment, our biodiversity, and our own internal systems. Where is the middle ground? Do you believe we can find a way to scale cottage industries without sacrificing sustainability and environmental ethics? Do you want to touch on that? I have some things to say about it, Bill. Yeah, we better hope so. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah, and, and I don't think it's going to be our choice, I, you know, and I think we will find a middle ground. And I think yeah. that those of us that are trying to learn how to at least grow some things, I don't, th you know, I believe in specialization. Not everybody has to grow everything, but I do know that the people that are a little bit closer to the land are healthier and happier. I think that's, you know, mm -hmm. and so what's wrong with having more of that in your community? Also, you know, I think right. there's side effects to that. Yeah. And learning how to take care of each other. But yeah, nobody knows the ultimate answers to those. What you need to do is pick what you're going to do next. And you should do that around your passion and around what you really want. And there'll be plenty of people. If it's, if it's never to grow anything or any seeds or anything at all, um, I'm sure there'll be plenty of us out there that are doing it that will trade with you, whatever you end up doing, if you're passionate right. about it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So here's my take on it. Um, and I started, a, you know, my, my starting point on a lot of projects is like, what if we had 10,000 people with seed banks in their house? And, you know, we haven't gotten to 10,000, but I know that we've had over six great American seed ups. We've had over, you know, 3,000 people scoop seeds. And, yeah. you know, about 10, 12 years ago, I was having a conversation with my buddy, Scott Murray, who's a commercial farmer consultant he's organic over in san diego and uh, on my and i was actually in san diego talking with him and on the way back from san diego on the drive back to phoenix i started thinking and i did the math in my head what would it take to feed phoenix as far as urban farms go and when i say urban farm i'm talking about a backyard garden that might feed four to ten or twenty people and where i reflected back to with that was when I went back to college, I went back to college late in life. I, I, at 39, I ended up at Arizona State University and uh, I owned a software company back then, which was making enough money for me to get, you know, make all, get all my bills paid, but it didn't make a lot of money. And I looked at my front and backyard and I thought, you know what? I can grow food and take it to the market. So for about three years, I grew food in my front and backyard, including flowers, cut flowers, by the way. Cut flowers are very specialty, and they sold out every week back then, and they still do now from what I hear. And, you know, I, was, I wasn't making a ton of money, 
but for the gardening time in my yard, which was probably 10 hours a week, and my market time, which was probably eight hours a week, I was making three to four hundred dollars a week yeah. going to the market and yeah. selling to a couple of chefs here in town. In fact, one of the chefs that I sold to, Susan at the Calico Cow, what I would do is I would go to the market. I would harvest every, I'd get up very early on a Wednesday morning and I would harvest everything that needed to be harvested in my yard. And I would uh, load it in the refrigerator and then load it in the truck and go to the market. And anything that I had left over, I would just take to Susan at the end of the day. And she always fed me a couple, three times a week. So not only was I making cash, I was also <laughs> what a great story. getting fed. And, you know, this is this whole, all this concept about growing wheat exponentially and growing food in your yard, it all points to one concept that I've had to wrap my head around over the past couple of decades. And that is this notion of lack. I yeah. believe that there is only one place on the planet that lack lives. Because when I look at the abundance that grows around me on my local urban farm here in Phoenix, there ain't no lack. The only yeah. place, the only place that lack lives is between our ears. Yeah. When you look <laughs> at the, when you look at the abundance that comes out of your garden that can feed your family and that could, you know, you, you guys have four in your family plus renters down the hill that you share with, I'm sure. If you got really serious, about growing food, I'll bet you could grow food for 10 to 15 people. Yeah, no, you're totally right. Totally so right. Back to Christian's question, what I pondered back on that drive about 10 years ago from San Diego is how many urban farms would it take to feed Phoenix? And I started with 10,000, uh, but it, it, it's ultimately 80 to 100,000. But guess what? I'll bet there are 80 to 100,000 underemployed people in Phoenix that could start a garden in their back and front yard. I grow more food in my front yard than I do in my backyard that could, you know, that could address this challenge that could address this problem. And I think we, it's times like these, and I've been educating about permaculture and about growing your own food for over 30 years. And what I've noticed with my education business is that in when times are good, I have an okay business. People listen. You know, my my podcast is five years old this month, and people listen and they get engaged to a certain level. When times are challenging, like in 2008 and 2009, my business and the people that listen to me exploded exponentially, as did it this year. Yeah. I've never seen this kind of growth. My fruit tree program, you know, I educate people about fruit trees, and we bring in about... 5,000 fruit trees every year that we sell here in Phoenix. And usually at the end of the selling season, which is toward the end of January, we have, you know, a couple hundred trees left. I'll tell you, we're running low and running out of most of the varieties that we have that people will pick up in January. So when, wow. when times of struggle happen, people get very clear about what's important. And yeah. that is growing your own food yeah. in your yard. And we have tens of thousands of acres in the Phoenix metropolitan area that are dirt and gravel and grass that grow stuff that is pointless to grow. Does it sound like I'm preaching? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's some really great statistics I dug up for the this seed saving for farmers course we're doing online right now. And, you know, a fifth of the world's food now is grown in urban areas. Uh -huh, it is. Exactly. You know, so we know that's true. Brad Lancaster claims that there's enough rain, as little as they have in Tucson, Arizona, that there's enough to grow the food that people would need in Tucson right there within the city limits Yep. using permaculture and intensive methods. They've, they've run some pretty good numbers about yeah. that. And you can you can Google up Brad Lancaster and his catching rainwater um, magic yep. that he that oh, he gets into, amazing. you know, and then United Nations statistics. Point out that um, 80% of the food in the world is produced on two hectares or less. What is it? Or hectares less. like That's two. Right. Yeah, five acres or less. And almost all of it, the vast majority are owned by families. Yep. Small family farms are the people that produce the world's food. And we've become urbanized. And so it's not subsistence. It's just small market farming. 
that's yep. done that. Yeah. You know, 90% of the fresh vegetables consumed in this, in Russia come from small dacha garden, home gardens. Uh, you know, part wow. of that's just because it's better fresh picked out of your own garden. Right. And so everybody, professors, everybody from every walk of life there has a garden and grows something. And, and they're highly urban areas, even. Everybody has a dacha, you know, so it's just a it's a choice in some ways and mm-hmm. there are a lot of choices i think and it's going to be a beautiful transition we're the only people that talk about having all of our food come you know through supermarkets and have it processed and so and look what it's doing to us we're sick you know we can't afford our own diet and our own yeah. system in some ways and i know i'm you know generalizing and there's all sorts of nuance to what i'm saying but generally that's true and so you may not want to become a subsistence farmer, but do you want to be healthy <laughs> right. mentally, you know, physically? You know, do you want those volatile oils in your grains from your fresh ground pasta? I mean, in a way, this talk is coming right back around in a big circle. But what are we going to do that keeps Health. us healthy? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, you know, it's interesting. So I have Lyme disease and, and I've been treating it for about five years. And oh. I have this practitioner here in Phoenix who I work with, and I go in about once a year to get blood work done. Um, so yeah. I have a, you know, since 2014, six years, I have a six-year history with Sherry of doing blood work. When COVID hit in March, given that both Heidi and I have Lyme disease, we decided yeah. to hunker down. We basically yeah. self-sequester. We live at home together. We do great together. Uh, we grow a lot of food, a lot of our food here, and we only eat organically. So I went from eating out out at restaurants, you know, three to six times a week, uh, probably three to five times a week, and to eating at home 100% of the time. And again, we only eat organic at home. My blood work this past time, and I know this isn't, you know, this isn't scientific evidence. It's more just interpretive evidence. She told me, Greg, I have never seen your blood work this good before and the only thing I can, <laughs> the only thing i can attribute that to is that i've been eating organic at home since march I love and that's it. just that's just like okay well that's that's good evidence for me yeah yeah so, i it's gonna it's a really interesting thing that we all have to go through and so again how can we come together how can we help each other you know, and not be so critical. And if somebody wants to go out every night, go for it. You know, yeah. I've got friends that own restaurants. And that's all really good. But but there's such a magic in coming home and at least growing some of your own food. Yeah, It's just incredible. I just pulled a loaf of einkorn rye bread out of the oven. Oh. You know, that was just flour, salt, and water made with a 130-year-old sourdough starter. You know, wow. <laughs> and every bite is good. <laughs> oh. Wow. So there's there's a couple of questions on how to save specific seeds. I'm going to encourage you to get Bill's book. Tell me a little bit about the book, Bill, and where, the, or, where people can order it. Oh, um, there's a Kindle version on uh, on Amazon. It's called Basic Seed Saving. Mm-hmm. You can order a physical copy on RockyMountainSeeds.org website. You can order a bunches of them if you want to teach a class or whatever. And the whole idea is to start with the easiest to save seeds first and work your way up. And so it's divided into three sections, easy, sort of medium, and more expert or more difficult. Yeah. And um, it was written in 1992 when I thought the world was going to blow up. And the idea was let's have a, a really cheap pamphlet in a way that if people had that and some seeds, they could make it. The, yeah. Everything you really need to know about how to do it's in there. It's not there's no fluff or pictures or anything, but the basic information's there. And as somebody else said, you know, you could learn uh, all the information to save everything's probably on the internet now. You know, it would just take you too long to find it. You know, the, the best of it anyway. So this is kind of a nice little condensed version. And, and again, we teach uh, online seed saving courses at uh, RockyMountainSeeds.org. We're doing a, one for farmers now. This spring, we're going to do a teacher training if you're interested in teaching those oh, in your community. Yes. And then next fall, we'll do a grain school online 
Oh, nice. enforced online, and we're going to yep. just keep doing that for right now. And it allows us to get the best teachers from all over the world. It's really yep. turned out to be interesting. And we do, you know, live office hours, and there's a lot of questions and back and forth and stuff. So, yeah. So, well, plus, plus on the Great American Seed Up site, you can get books there with your seeds. Right. We put a we put one of those books in with the pack with the the groups the that we sell. Exactly. That's right. Exactly. Plus, plus. Out of that seed school that I went to in a, for a week down in Tucson in 2011, Bill and Bell and I created Seed School Online. And part right. of the summit next week is part of the summit next week is our Seed School Online. So you can actually purchase a copy of the summit recordings, or you can buy a VIP pass. And the VIP pass includes our full nine classes of Seed School Online and a PDF copy of Bill's book, Seed on Saving Seeds. So that will be available. Uh, that's available to you to start learning about seed saving. If you go to globalseedsummit.com, that's available right now. You can you can sign up and start learning about seeds right now. So, well, and the, the, the summit itself is free when we put it on, right? Yeah. And yeah, that, that, this will just if you want access to all the recordings and stuff afterwards. Exactly. And so that yeah. actually, and I'll be real straight with you, it does a couple of things. First of all, you get to learn all about seed saving. The Seed School Online course is an amazing course that Bill and Bell developed and gave through us since I think 2015 is the first time we gave, or 2014, I can't remember. So for the past five or six years, it's been in development. But the other thing that it does is it supports the work that we're doing. You know, it, I have three full-time people that work with us to bring you the education that we do here. So, you know, it does, first of all, it teaches you how to supercharge your seed saving, but it also support, and it also supports uh, the work that we're doing so that we can continue to bring you more of this content and, and so on and so on like that. So, oh my gosh, yeah. the uh, chat room is just exploding. I love it. <laughs> well, it is five o'clock, or it has. We've been on for an hour. Yeah, an hour and can... four minutes. So, all right. Well, I'm going to call it good tonight. We will be starting on Tuesday at 3 p.m. You know, I can't remember if it's 3 p.m. Mountain or 3 p.m. Pacific. Just go to global.com <laughs> and sign up, and you'll get emails about when it's starting. The daily presentations start at a particular time and then they're recorded and they're available for you to listen to for free for 24 hours. So on Tuesday, you'll be able to listen to Tuesday's presentations until, I don't know, six or seven o'clock on Wednesday. Um, and then Wednesday's presentations will be able to, you know, you'll be able to watch for 24 hours and so on. Bill will be joining us. Uh, I think, are you joining us every day at five o'clock, Bill, to answer questions? Something, yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. They were just sending me the schedule. So, yeah. So if you have save your seed saving question, we'll be on. Yep. Yeah. So that'll be live. The presentations are right. uh, recorded. Although in a lot of cases, the presenters that we recorded with, uh, they'll be available after their presentation to answer questions. So we're doing that as well. Don't miss Karen from the Philippines. Oh, my God. She was, that was, I, I have to tell you, her presentation was life-altering for me. Because I, oh, I get yeah. to meet with these people online. We pull up a Zoom meeting and we actually record it. The what she talked about, and I'm getting yeah. chills as I'm sharing it, the what she talked about changed my life. Yeah, they're doing great work. They taught um, courses to 5,000 farmers last year in the Philippines. Seed wow. basic seed saving, the basic yeah. stuff we're teaching. Yeah, there's real hope in there. Yeah. Hey, Bill, we can we can ship seeds to Canada, can't we? Yeah. Yeah, that's what yeah. I thought, Susan. Yes, we can ship seeds to you. We'll have to figure out the shipping on them. What we do is we put them in priority boxes, so there's a flat rate shipping on them, and I can get that for you if you want to email me. Uh, I am Greg at urbanfarm.org. Greg at urbanfarm.org in the chat room. So you can email me with questions there. Yeah. Any, th any last thoughts? Oh, I'm just happy um, to be here and to be, yeah, to have good. so many people that are so interested at this juncture in the world and are willing to make themselves happy and they're, are, 
healthy and their communities healthy and to to uh, grow and share seats with us. I'm yeah. I'm truly humbled that that we get to do this. So thank yeah. you very much, everybody. Yeah, and I, I just scanning real quickly down through the chat box. Thank you all for the well wishes around Lyme. I'm actually doing pretty great with it. It's chronic Lyme. I've had it for over 20 years, and it was finally diagnosed in 2014. So um, wow. Yeah. yeah. It, you know, it is what it is. It's a new normal, and I'm 60 years old and getting to deal with uh, figuring this out. So welcome to our <laughs> life, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, you're doing spectacular, so keep keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you. I just <laughs> tell people I can't help myself. <laughs> thank you, Bill. Thank you, everybody, right. for right. joining us. And we appreciate having you here greatly. And uh, as I like to say, farm out, and we will catch you on the flip side. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.